Hi, I'm Pat Brown, CEO and founder of Impossible Foods, a company with a simple mission to completely replace the use of animals as a food production technology by 2035. The use of animals as a technology for transforming plants into meat and milk and fish is by far the greatest threat to our future that humanity has ever faced. Animal agriculture is responsible for as much greenhouse gas emissions as every form of power transportation combined. It is by far the biggest user of water of any industry on the planet and by very far the biggest polluter of water of any industry on the planet. And there's an even bigger problem. 45% of the entire land surface of Earth is actively being exploited by animal agriculture. To put that footprint in perspective, with all its infrastructure, every city on Earth can fit on less than 1% of Earth's land area. All the grains and fruits and vegetables that are directly consumed by humans, they contain essentially all the essential nutrients to feed the world's population, and they occupy 7% of Earth's land area. The world's soybean crop alone contains 50% more human usable protein, more of every essential amino acid than all the meat consumed globally. And those soybeans are grown on less than 1% of Earth's land area. That land footprint basically underlies probably an even greater threat to the future of our planet, to future generations, than climate change. Or an ongoing, rapidly regressing, catastrophic collapse in global biodiversity. So in the past 50 years, almost entirely through the use of animals as a food production technology, we wiped out more than two thirds of the wild animal populations that previously lived on Earth. We have 1.5 billion cows being raised just to produce the world's supply of meat and milk, and those foods add up to only 12% of the human protein supply. Those cows outweigh every remaining wild terrestrial vertebrate, every mammal, bird, reptile, and amphibian combined by more than a factor of 10. That's an environmental catastrophe. That biodiversity is what keeps the ecosystems healthy that keep our planet viable. And that land footprint is just getting bigger because the demand for meat is not getting smaller, it's, it's growing. And when you see smoke coming from the Amazon, that's the secondhand smoke from your burger because 95% of Amazon deforestation is being done to expand the land for animal agriculture. Most people, when they think of animals in the food system, they think, oh, it's just an animal, it's part of nature. We have not covered the world with cows and replaced biodiversity with cows because we love cows and they're part of nature. In the food system, a cow is just an incredibly inefficient prehistoric technology for turning plants into meat. But meat lovers around the world do not love that their meat comes from the cadaver of an animal. They just accept that that's the only way historically we've ever been able to produce meat that delivers what meat lovers want. So the engineering challenge is, okay, here is this food, the demand for which is causing catastrophic damage to the global environment because of the prehistoric way we make it today. Can we figure out a way to make a food that delivers the same value to consumers, that specific deliciousness, juiciness, flavors and aromas that consumers associate with meat, the protein and iron and other nutrient value that they get from it, and the convenience and affordability of meat? Can we figure out a way to do this that outperforms the cow? Welcome to the human health track of the Engines Tough Tech Summit. I'm very excited for this conversation with Pat Brown, founder and CEO of Impossible Foods. And I'm sure you are too, after that, seeing that compelling video. Uh, you can see Pat's bio in the speaker uh, notes on the Attendify platform, but just in brief, Pat founded Impossible after he completed his PhD in biochemistry, his medical degree plus a residency in pediatrics, and after he had his dream job at Stanford University exploring a whole range of important topics from research 
on HIV and other infectious diseases to DNA microarrays to launching the public library of science to blow open access to medical and scientific literature. So Pat has always followed the joy of discovering new things and the love of working on new ideas combined with the mission to make the world better. And Pat and Impossible Foods are on a mission to make nutritious and delicious meat and dairy products from plants to satisfy meat lovers. But Pat hasn't had a beef burger since I believe it was 1976. So why did Pat, why did you take on this mission? And tell us more about what launched you into the, the compelling video that we just saw. Basically, I never had any interest in the food business. I was, I'm probably in the kind of very low percentile uh, in the population as far as my general interest in food. Um, and um, I had the most awesome job. It was, as Anne said, literally my dream job at Stanford. Uh, not looking for a new gig, was never interested in going into the business world, not that I have anything against it, but it just wasn't nearly as interesting as the job I already had. Um, but when I um, had a sabbatical and um, basically tried to identify the most important problem in the world that I could um, potentially contribute to solving, um, and I you know, assumed it would be something related to uh, the environmental impact of humans on the planet, um, I very quickly realized that um, the most destructive technology on earth isn't, um, you know, the power industry using fossil fuels, um, it's not the transportation industry, it's not the chemicals industry, it's the use of animals um, as a technology for producing um, meat and milk and fish, um, by far the most destructive technology in human history. And um, I'd be happy to debate that with anyone in the audience who wants to step up and debate with me, but um, it's just true. And, um, and once I realized that, uh, and realized also that nobody was seriously working on it, and, and, and that this is the opportunity and the only opportunity really that I can think of for uh, literally turning back the clock on, on climate change, as well as halting the catastrophic collapse of global biodiversity, um, I felt like, okay, I'm in. And um, the way uh, to do it um, is clearly not to try to get people to change their behavior. That has been tried repeatedly, most recently by China, who asked citizens to cut back their meat and dairy consumption by half, to absolutely no avail. Um, that the solution has to be to recognize that the problem isn't that people love meat, it's that we're using ridiculous technology to produce it, this ridiculous prehistoric technology um, using animals to turn plants into these foods. And that um, it ought to be possible to be able to produce all the foods we make today using animals and do a much better job of it, not just in terms of environmental impact. Uh, um, and again, this is the most destructive industry on earth, but in terms of the things that matter most to consumers, deliciousness, the nutritional value, affordability, and so forth. Um, and if we could do so, um, we could pull the economic rug out from under the incumbent industry, which was the real intention of founding the company. Our, our goal is to completely replace the use of animals, the food technology globally by 2035. That was the goal from the start. It's still the goal. And notice that it's not to be the dominant food company in the world, it's to get rid of the most destructive technology on earth, but that the way to do it is basically just make better products as defined by consumers, compete in the marketplace and let the market work. And I think uh, if history um, is a guide, uh, it's entirely possible within a decade to replace a ridiculous technology with a better one. Yeah. Pat, there's so many great threads to pull on but maybe one to, to ask you about is, was there a moment when you personally decided you were gonna lead Impossible Foods? I've heard a little bit about the, you know, the founding story of Impossible, but did you have a moment when you, when you recognized I'm the one who has to, to be the lead and really be the founder and go with Impossible Foods, given that you were uh, inside of academia, inside of Stanford? 
Um, yeah, well, that's a very interesting uh, uh, point, which is that I, you know, yes, I was at Stanford. I had this awesome job there. I never considered myself defined by the particular job I had there. It was just like, um, you know, I'm always going to at any given point work on whatever it is that I think it well. To some degree, it's curiosity driven, but whatever I think I can do that will have the biggest positive impact on the world, I feel like that's my job. Um, and um, so when I realized that this was was it, um, there was no angst whatsoever about it. I just figured, okay, I gotta figure out how to make this work. Um, and uh, even though, you know, like I say, I love my, my, my job, but, um, and I wouldn't say there was exact, if there was a light bulb moment, I probably slept through it because um, it was just sort of a, a, a process of thinking about um, what will it take to accomplish this goal? And uh, at some point I realized that, um, you know, it was to use the marketplace, the most subversive institution on earth is, is, is the market. If you can get, if you, if you can um, figure out a way to get consumer choice to drive your mission, um, there's not much that can stop you. Um, so then it had to be a company. And fortunately, I live in the most target dense uh, um, place on earth when it comes to investors. Um, you literally can't walk down the street in Palo Alto without tripping over a venture capitalist. And um, so it was relatively easy to, you know, just you know, go out and raise money and kick this into gear. And and I have to say, when I started, I didn't have any grand plan for how we we're going to do this. I basically just felt like this is a technology problem, a science and technology problem. And step one is to study the most important scientific question in the world, which is what makes meat delicious? Because if you can answer that question, you're, you know, halfway to solving the problem and can then turn your attention to how can we find sustainable sources of all the necessary and you know molecular components uh, uh, that add up to the emergent properties of meat. Um, and um, so we basically just dived in, started doing the research, pursuing you know uh, uh, ideas for how to do it. And uh, that's what we've been doing ever since. And at some point, you know, we had to graft on a commercial business. So initially for the first few years, it was basically, we had a couple of business people and their job was just to, you know, manage the budget. And the, you know, 95% of the company was scientists and engineers. Um, at, one, at some point we felt we had uh, reached a threshold where we had a product, we we're never gonna release a product. So the only customer we care about is a hardcore meat eater. We're not interested in making a veggie burger. We're, we have zero interest in creating better foods for vegetarians. Um, and we were only going to launch a product when we had a product that we, based on you know, very, very stringent criteria, i.e. some of the most hard ass chefs in the world, basically telling us that this is something that they would serve as meat to their consumers. That's, that's when we felt like, okay, now it's time to graft on a, an actual commercial business. So, um, you know, on the exterior to the most of the world, we look like a food company and behind the scenes, it's kind of like the Wizard of Oz, um, behind the scenes, you know, it's, it's a science and technology company that is um, uh, basically working on saving the planet. How did you decide uh, with the go to market of the chefs? How did that sort of decision and thinking Everybody was sitting around the table. You were. How did you decide that that was going to be how you went into into the market? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> well, you know, when we were first, uh, uh, we were an R and D company, and then we um, built a pilot capacity to be able to, you know, figure out how to scale the prototypes that we were building in the lab. And um, when we had um, feedback from chefs that this was something that they'd put on their menu, it was a complete no brainer. I mean, first of all, the, the, we had very limited production uh, early on. So we had to, so the way we thought about it was the value of any sale of our product, the, the pittance that we got back in terms of money from that sale was completely irrelevant. It was all about sending a message to the world. And the message is delicious meat, uncompromising delicious meat 
that, you know, these very hardcore meat chefs would voluntarily put on their menu and serve as meat um, can, can be made from plants. It doesn't have to come from animals. That was, that was the critical message to send. It's still the critical message to send because most people in the world have this notion that meat is inseparable from the technology that we currently use to produce it, which is, which is animals. But that's as ridiculous an idea as 200 years ago thinking that, you know, power transportation is inseparable from the horse, basically. Um, it's, you know, the, the, the way we produce these foods now is, is, is just a technology. And so we had to send that message to the world. And, and there's no, I think, more effective way of sending it than, than having the implicit endorsement of someone whose livelihood and reputation depends on serving delicious meat to their customers, choosing to put it on their carefully curated menu. Yeah. Um, the other thing is that, you know, uh, if you launch a product at retail, there's a, a huge signal to noise problem, right? I mean, you go into a grocery store, there's tens of thousands of choices. Most people do that. It's not an, it's not an event when they go to a grocery store. They're just kind of like robotically navigating the aisles and grabbing the same stuff they bought last week. And um, so the ability to stand out from the noise, you know, it just, just isn't there. Whereas when you go to a restaurant, it's the menu is curated. So, you know, you're not overwhelmed with uh, choices. It's a more thoughtful exper experience in general. You're making a choice to go to a restaurant. You're often there with other people. So as, as a vehicle for, you know, uh, um, introducing people to a, pro a new product, I think it's inherently much better. And, um, and also the fact that you, you know, anyway, blah, blah, blah. And you have people on site who are advocating for it to you, which you just don't get in retail. You know, you have the, the servers who are basically telling you about it and why you should buy it and blah, 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 blah. So I don't know why anyone would launch a food product anywhere else, basically. Yeah. I'm wondering, Pat, when you're, so I hear, you know, lead with, with message and I'll say scale to follow. I wonder how you thought about or what you expected from the response of the animal production industry. And at what point did that sort of really start uh, bubbling up um, and, and start maybe paying attention to that message that you were trying to, to get out there, uh, particularly to consumers. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about um, kind of the incumbent response and at what time did that really start coming into play? Um. Yeah, that's an interesting question. Well, of course, we knew that, um, you know, th they weren't going to be huge fans. And, um, uh, but on the other hand, I felt like we had, we, uh, we had the, a, a, a great deal of kind of protection against a lot of things they could do that they might, might try to do um, politically, which is all we're asking is a fair chance to compete in the marketplace, okay? It's on us. We only we achieve our mission if we do a better job than they're doing of delivering what their current consumers want. Okay, and that's all we ask is just a fair shot at it. So in a sense, it's that's a very disarming position to have in terms of any attempt, any any kind of use of their political clout uh, to interfere with us. And you'd be surprised, you know, some of our uh, uh, biggest advocates in terms of politics are are these. Uh, you know, extreme right-wing, uh, you know, uh, market fundamentalists. Um, a lot of people think it's, oh, it's all these, you know, uh, um, kind of lefty coastal people that that love us. No, people who love the free market love uh, innovation and competition in the free market. But anyway, the point is, very long before we had a public presence, okay, they became aware of us. I mean, we were talking, you know, we, we, we weren't keeping it a complete secret that we were trying to do this, but we weren't, weren't out there seeking attention. Um, but we knew from various sources that they were looking at us, including I met with a, a lobbyist, one of the most well-recognized lobbyists in Washington, who one of my in investors introduced me to, and he showed me confidentially an email he had received. This is, we were not on the market. An email he'd received from another fellow lobbyist basically saying, um, hey, I've got this very lucrative gig for you, um, uh, and it is to uh, 
uh, take down or better have Congress or, or, or the USDA take down this silly company called Impossible Foods. And the budget is essentially unlimited. And this is before we had sold a single product on the market. So I think they had gotten wind of the fact that we weren't just going to be another veggie burger company. We were, we were out there to outperform them in everything that consumers uh, value and that this was actually a doable thing. Um, since then, basically, the main weapon they've used against us is just disinformation. Um, you know, uh, uh, misrepresenting our product and our mission and so forth to try to um, scare consumers. But uh, so far, I don't think they've done a very good job of it. Yeah, I'm wondering, Pat, um, as the as you've been on the journey with the company, there are probably those as we were just talking about where you knew like the response wasn't going to be supportive. But it seems like you have found some really interesting and maybe unexpected allies as you've built the company. So I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about where and how you have found allies for your mission and for building impossible and where were some of those unlikely, you know, places or, or institutions that surprised you that they would be on board and wanting to support. Um, yeah, I think something that people find unexpected, but it wasn't all that surprising is that you know, obviously, um, the, for us to succeed, we have to be able to sell our product where people are looking for meat, okay? And we have to be able to sell our product as meat in all the same venues and form factors and stuff like that, uh, that the incumbent industry is doing. And I think people sort of figured, well, first of all, they figured, hey, you wouldn't, you know, you'd have some kind of moral uh, objections to selling to Burger King or White Castle, these companies that make a lot of money from selling meat. Well, that's nuts. Um, we are extreme pragmatists, okay? And and that's obviously the place to go if, if you know, if, you're, if you want to compete against the incumbent industry. So, in fact, we embrace places, we seek out places, we, we deliberately avoid selling to, um, uh, you know, restaurants that, that cater to vegetarians and vegan. I have nothing against veg, I, you know, I'm, I haven't eaten meat for, de you know, decades, but, but, um, but that's pointless in terms of our mission. Um, we, we only want to sell to people who would otherwise be selling the animal products. And of course, it's business. The, the, these companies, they're, they're, not, they're not doing what they're doing because they love the incumbent industry. They're doing what they're doing because they can make money selling stuff. And so there's a natural alliance, but, a lot, but some people I think feel like, well, you've really dirtied yourself by getting, getting into a deal with Burger King or something like that. And I just feel like, well, you know, what right. else would we do? Right. So, so Pat, I'd love to talk a little bit about um, kind of manufacturing and supply chain. So here is part of our audience. Um, I think we have a number of, you know, founders and, and teams of, of tough tech companies that I'll say are breathing, you know, down like the jaws of ma scaling up manufacturing mm -hmm. and sorting out supply chain. So I'm wondering if you could share uh, some insights that you had from, I'd say, like the early days of what maybe you thought um, and the team thought manufacturing and scale up would look like when you got going. And then if there's been uh, a way that you think about that now, you know, that's different than maybe when you got started. Um, but yeah, I would love to just hear you talk about the framing that you're used in the past when you were getting going and then how you think about that now. Because I think that's, if for companies that actually make a product like at global scale, you know, that's a non, -con you know, it's a pretty consequential activity. So I wish you awesome. had told me that uh, five years ago, but um, yeah, well, when, you know, right from the start, um, obviously, our goal is to completely replace the incumbent industry by 2035. So it goes without saying, scale is important. It's like and, 72 um, million tons. Well, it's actually it's actually more than a trillion tons of of animal products sold every year. Um, so 10 to the 12th, big number, and and um, 
and effectively it would require us to be scaling exponentially. Um, we were thinking early on, you know, in terms of the the thinking about the ingredients we would use and sourcing and so forth. Uh, we were deliberately, at least for our initial products, we 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 only used ingredients, we optimized around ingredients for which there was an existing supply chain of sufficient scale to get us through the near term. And then we were, we were then and, and still working on, uh, you know, longer term projects to develop a supply chain for potentially better ingredients and so forth, working to some extent on our own, trying to develop partnerships to uh, to build a supply chain that's more optimized for what we're trying to do. The existing supply chain is is basically most of the, you know, large volume crops. Um, they're optimized basically just provide crude, cheap macronutrients to feed livestock. Okay, so not at all optimized for what we're doing, but nevertheless, we had to figure out a way to use those to get going. Um, uh, then, so we are making long-term investments in a, in a better supply chain and so forth. But then scaling. So you know, I I I knew just as a scientist that you know the scaling rules for physical stuff and making physical stuff are complicated. It's not you know <laughs> multiply by x or whatever. Um, uh, but um, as a practical matter, you know, I hadn't fully realized the the comp how complicated it gets when you're when you're going through the stages of scale up. Um, I think now, now at least I'm aware of it. I'm not sure that I'm better at it, but um, the uh, um, the other thing that, that I think uh, I was aware of, but I hadn't fully grasped is that the incumbent industry from which we, that we're trying to take down, okay, it's actually advantageous for us. They have no agility whatsoever. I mean, they, this is just something that just lumbers you know, massively inefficiently along year after year doing nothing interesting. Um, uh, so that's good. But on the other hand, you know, the whole uh, uh, agricultural system basically and the food system in general, uh, you know, is, is and uh, you know, Impossible is part of that now. So, uh, you know, it's very uninnovative, okay. Um, and and things change very little from year to year. Like, you know, the innovation of the year is like a, a new flavor of Cheetos or something. And um, the, the, but that hurts us in the sense that uh, if we want to change the um, system from which we get all our raw materials um, and their notion of change is like a few percent a year and we want them to know, we want to like, double or more every year, um, I hadn't realized how difficult that that actually is. It makes it more of a challenge. And, and in some sense, you know, it means that we're looking more toward um, actually having control of the supply chain, because if it's not, if, if, if we can't just get it to move by sending market signals that if you, you know, if you scale this, we'll be there on the receiving end ready to pay you money for it. Uh, um, it becomes more and more of an issue. So, it, 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 you know, it's evolving. Uh, it's complicated. It's our, it's, I would say in a way, our biggest challenge. I feel like it, a lot of people thought biggest challenge is, oh, meat lovers are just never going to accept that something's made from plants. Actually, a surprising thing is that, that people who love meat, love meat. They're not going to stop wanting meat. That's for sure. But they don't love that it's made from the, the corpse of, of, you know, an animal that was cut up in a filthy slaughterhouse. Um, they just accept that that's the only way it's ever been made and they're willing to live with that and so forth. But actually there's no fundamental objections. It's literally not only that, they would prefer that, that, I mean, we've done tons of research on this across the country. Meat lovers are not going to compromise on deliciousness. They're not going to compromise on protein and iron and, and versatility and, and affordability and stuff like that. But they would much prefer to have their meat be made directly from plants. So I thought that was going to be, you know, more of a challenge than it is, but it's actually not. Um, the uh, it's it is scaling. It is um, also the fact that the the kind of impedance mismatch with this this you know uh, um, su supply chain that that thinks slow linear growth is like awesome. Uh, and, and, you know, our intentions. Yeah. Yeah. So 
that um, concept of, you know, agility and the need for that in, it sounds like originally when you're going to your partners in supply chain, the idea maybe that more of that supply chain has to be in-house and yet how do you build in that agility? I'm wondering, Pat, if you can talk a little bit about, you know, how you think about the team at Impossible. You know, where do you find your manufacturing team? You know, what are you looking for in Impossible's culture um, to keep it, you know, on mission? And I heard there was a lot of, you know, need for sort of thinking, you know, agilely different within an incumbent industry. And yet, you know, you're part of that industry now, you know, you, you sort of alluded to that. So I'm well, really think, interested in how do you think about, you know, that team building early on? And then how do you think about, or have you shifted your thinking on, you know, what you're looking for in team and the types of, you know, values and execution that you're looking for? Um, you know, cause the company has, has, has grown tremendously and gone through different phases. So how has that, how has that evolved for you in thinking through the team? Yeah, very good question. So initially, as I said, basically, you could say we were, and we still are at our heart, we are like a planetary technology company, basically focused on, you know, addressing the biggest environmental threat our planet has ever faced. Um, and and that was sort of our frame of, of reference early on, and obviously uh, we were doing it by developing a technology platform to replace a ridiculous one. Um, but then yes, when we went into uh, the food world and the commercial side of the food business, obviously, you know, those of us, the, most of the people at the company didn't have a clue about how that system operates. And of course it's got its own kind of arcane culture and. And, and rules and system of relationships and and stuff like that, that we were clueless about. Um, so we obviously we hired some people that that were familiar with the incumbent industry. We only want to hire people who are really, they get our mission, they're all in on our mission. Uh, they're unambiguous about the fact that, you know, our, our, our goal is to, to completely eliminate a big incumbent industry. And if you have problems with that, you know, don't, don't join us. Um, uh, so that weeds out some people from, from, you know, the incumbent industry. Um, there is a lot of specialized know-how that's required to do, do food manufacturing and sales and so forth. And, and we really need that. So we did have to bring in a lot of that. It's, it's funny though, when you were saying now you're part of the food industry, and I guess that's true. Um, I still think we are like, you know, part of the saving the plant industry, um, uh, that has to work through the, 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 the food industry to, to achieve our mission. And uh, certainly we um, don't come pre-bought into a lot of the assumptions and values of that industry. I think, you know, frankly it is, and no offense, cause you know, good people working and all that, but it, it's, 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 it's built on the concept that things don't change much and and you know very sort of a lumbering kind of uh way of moving so we have to you know a lot of the people that are in our uh kind of manufacturing supply chain team actually come from the tech industry where you know the generation time of technology is on the scale of months to a couple of years as opposed to a thousand years or ten thousand years and um uh and that's that's very very valuable. They don't, you know, they're they're much used to. The other thing is that you know when you want to move fast, there's inherent inefficiencies in it. Okay, like a a thing that that, and I think that if you're in an industry where things change very slowly, you just kind of like you know your head would explode. But but you know we have to do things where well, in order to keep this ball rolling, we have to make a substantial investment that that is is you know, capital investment or something like that, but we're only gonna use it for like two years, okay? Um, because meanwhile, we're, we're, you know, we're, we're going to replace it and so forth. So the thing about scaling, I, I have this um, expression that I've used also in my previous life, uh, um, waste makes haste. Um, that if you wanna move fast, 
you can't you 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 have to accept the fact that you're going to do things for example in research you invest in a lot of things where you know they might fail okay well if you're in the food industry you're not you don't tend to do that but if you're in science you know if 90 percent of things you invest in fail that's just the price of of doing things no one's ever done before 10 percent wasteful what i said 10 percent worked <laughs> yeah yeah no that's just it but but you you have to have this mentality and you have to basically you know one of the things that I noticed uh, early on in scaling that there are a lot of engineers that were awesome, but but you know they would spend well, they they weren't used to the notion of the opportunity cost of time being extremely high, especially if you're us, where we have a very aggressive timeline and so forth, and also where basically the demand is exceeds our supply and so forth. So we would have situations where so, you know really really good engineer would, uh, you know, and I, I wouldn't realize it until what, but would spend, you know, while, while the opportunity cost of, you know, a day, two years from now might be, you know, in the millions of dollars, um, they're spending two weeks trying to decide between two $30,000 valves, okay? And I'm thinking, no, just buy them both. And when you decide, you know, sell the other one on eBay or something like that. But, you know, like just in the time it took to have this conversation, we wasted thirty thousand dollars. So there is there is it's I think finding people who have the notion of the sense of urgency and that, you know, what you value is not cost like you don't want to throw money away, but you just have to accept the fact that that, you know, in order to get the speed you need, you're not optimizing for for cost control the way it would be if you're, you know, Heinz. Yeah. That's, uh, that's really interesting to think about. And, and I really love that you've sort of, you know, harkened back to like time in academia and this waste makes haste. So maybe continuing on that thread a little bit, Pat, I wonder, you know, are there aspects of your former life and maybe really focusing on academia? Because I think a lot of, you know, founders uh, for these types of companies are coming out of the academic enterprise, sort of deep in science and technology. So I'm wondering what you thought within your, that former, let's call it former life, really prepared like you well in thinking and then when you sort of made this transition, were there aspects that you were like, whoa, like this is kind of crazy in a completely different context than what, what I was used to? You know, did you find any of those sort of moments when you're like, what is going on over here? Like people think really differently, but then also really curious if you had any other, any other things that you're like, oh yeah, I'm going to carry that with me. I learned that from my past life and there's no way I'm letting, letting that value or that lesson go because it's, it's going to make me successful and impossible successful over here. would love to hear you talk a little bit more about that. Well, I mean, I think my, you know, my fundamental values haven't changed at all. Um, and um, uh, yeah, getting into this new business, there were a lot of cases where, you know, you realize that you carry around a worldview that you sort of think everybody shares. And, and when you're in basic research and so forth, there, there are sort of a lot of shared assumptions and values and so forth, but they're not prevalent in the outside world. And, um, and you know, leaving that, sometimes it's, there's this kind of like your head snaps back. What, did I just hear that? Um, uh, one thing that I've said before, and it sounds obnoxious, but, um, I hadn't realized how much business people care about money. And um, it, it literally came as kind of a surprise to me, like, you know, um, they're so obsessed about it. They think about, think about it all the time for its own sake. And um, I mean, money is really important, you know, like we're achieving our mission basically by taking money out of the pockets of the income industry. And we have to make money to be successful and so forth. So I totally respect all that, but uh, it's just not that interesting. And, um, and I think the other thing is that, you know, when you're going into a world where things change very slowly and your expectation is that, you know, things fa change fast. And also in my old world, there is this, there is this very high level of comfort 
with doing things that you're not sure are going to work, and, and in many cases you think they're, you know, unlikely to work, uh, and so forth. Um, and uh, but having a high degree of comfort with that, and also spending a lot of time not knowing whether <laughs> whether what you're doing is going anywhere, um, and uh, um, that's that's quite uncomfortable in the business world in a way. But you know, in the science world, people sort of know that the most successful scientists, or at least in the experimental sciences, probably theoretical as well, um, are the ones that have the most failed experiments um, because they're the ones that do the most experiments, and you know, a lot of them fail. Um, uh, but um, you know, there's a lower comfort level. So anyway, it's been a very interesting experience. I mean, I love the people. Look, you know, things that I work with people from the business world, from the food world, and so forth, and they're awesome. They're awesome. I have total respect for them and so forth. But it's definitely uh, uh, quite a. Uh, you you really have to kind of recognize that the world views are are different, and a lot of the assumptions are different, and you can kind of really get discombobulated when you go in assuming that you have shared assumptions and they're actually very far out of line. So that's been a, a, an interesting process. Yeah. Um, on the sort of different world views, um, just kind of switching um, a little bit in, you know, there seems to be, you know, sort of growing um, or at least really doubling down of kind of anti-science like sentiment, I think particularly in the United States and um, kind of what's happening to, I'll say some of our truth telling institutions and um, some of the erosion that I think people have uh, perceived as happening. I'm wondering if you have, you know, any you know, assessment or insights kind of on that situation um, and kind of its impact on companies that are, you know, science and technology based, you know, do have important missions. Do you have, um, do you encounter that on and worry about that on, you know, a monthly basis, not at all? Um, because it strikes me that, you know, a whole set of issues that we're trying to address for humanity, you know, do need grounding in some science and technology and the reality of where we're at, you know, as as human beings, Just wondering if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, it's it it. <laughs> yes, I have thoughts on that. I mean, for, for one thing, I feel like in the long run, assuming we don't destroy our planet, the truth eventually wins. Okay, so that's that's a good thing. That's a very positive thing. You know, uh, um, and um, but it you know can take time, and. We often come up against people who are uh, sort of cynically using the fear of science, the fear of technology, and so forth, to try to, um, you know, get people to to not trust us and so forth. What we've we've taken a stance all along that you know we're just going to be completely straight and honest and uh, answer every question honestly, you know, not hide from, not try to kind of pretend we're something else, you know, like there, there we've, you know, I've heard many people just basically said, you know, you got to kind of keep the, you know, genetic engineering on the down low and, you know, don't, don't show the science side of the company. It's like all friendly foodie type of stuff. Um, the fact that we actually have scientists, you know, behind the scenes would scare people away and so forth. And I just feel like, no, no, we're just not going to, we are who we are, you know, and, um, and that's good. There are certain, there are all these prevalent ideas that get thrown at us. They're so like, uh, it's it's weird that people don't question them. You know, uh, one that we hear all the time, and and it's something that just like defies common sense, is that um, actually it's possible to, you know, raise cattle sustainably. Okay, that well, you, there's such a thing as regenerative agriculture. First of all. If you just read the literature on it, like what kind of studies have there been that have ever supported any of the ridiculous claims they make? You know, there's tons of studies that basically debunk them and a handful of studies that are just 
not even addressing the fundamental question. They've set up an experiment that doesn't really address the fundamental question that they point to. I see it, you know, it works. Um, and all I would say is um, uh, just look at um, look at how we're creating farmland. Actually, can I just qu quickly go through a to a presentation that kind of relates to this? And Is it is it is it on the thing? My shared screen. Is it is it there? Are you seeing it? Okay. Are we seeing so, it? Yes. So first of all, we're using forty five percent of the entire ice free land surface of Earth to raise animals for food. Okay. That's an area bigger than North America, South America, Europe, and Australia combined. The entire that entire area either being grazed by livestock or raising feed crops for livestock, okay? That is a huge opportunity cost. And let me just, uh, if I can, so another thing to know, that land used to hold a lot more biomass than it does currently, okay? Um, the, the, and you can just see this right now when you watch the Amazon burn, this is the Amazon burning, you know, Ask yourself, okay, are we gonna be better off burning the Amazon and covering it with cows? And somehow that is going to sequester more carbon than, than we've just released into the atmosphere by burning this forest. Or, or historically, you know, the land, the uh, plant biomass and so forth that covered the land before you let loose 1.7 billion cows that outweigh every remaining wild mammal, bird, reptile, and amphibian on Earth by more than a factor of 10, okay? Outweigh every single wild animal on Earth by more than a factor of 10. Somehow, oh, that's making the planet healthier uh, and so forth. But anyway, no, we've released the equivalent of 16 years worth of current total greenhouse gas emissions um, into the atmosphere in the course of converting ecosystems that preexisted to uh, um, animal agriculture, and this is the this is the happy news. Okay, so there is happy news here. So this is this curve, if it's going to work, uh, um, shows the progression of the increase in atmospheric total greenhouse gas levels, and everybody has sort of seen this. So we're like 50% higher than we were um, in pre-industrial times. Okay, now. If I could snap my fingers right now and make that industry go away, okay, here's business as usual. Um, and if I snap my fingers and made it go away in 2020 right now, this is the bending the curve by virtue of reduced emissions and something magical about livestock related emissions, which is a large fraction of it is methane, okay? 45% of the methane in the atmosphere, which is potent greenhouse gas, comes from animal agriculture. And the magical thing about methane is it has a half-life of nine years, okay? Which means if you stop emitting that 45%, you know, if you stop maintaining it by continued emission, that 45% will decay with a half-life of nine years. And the, the, that amount of methane from livestock in the atmosphere is equivalent to uh, roughly 12 years worth of total current greenhouse gas emissions, okay? That will start decaying. And in the first uh, 10 years after we magically made the industry go away, decay of methane turns back the clock by six years. And in 20 years, it erases nine years of current greenhouse gas emissions. That's that pink sector, okay? Then there's the green sector. If we made the industry go away and allowed the biomass to recover to historic levels on that 45% of our surface, you can calculate. And there are several publications dating back to 2000 or so that have calculated this. Um, you can capture carbon um, faster. The net effect on greenhouse gases will outpace current emissions so that in 2040, if we made the industry go away today, atmospheric total greenhouse gas levels would be back to where they were in 2015. We would literally turn back the clock on climate change. And there's only one way to do that. Uh, and that's what we're doing. Anyway, so sorry, that was a rant, but I think this is really important. A anyone in the audience, do you have a way 
a simple way, a simple technology-based solution that will literally turn back the clock to 2015 if, if it was in place today. Raise your hand. But anyway, uh, this is doable. And it's and it, people think it's weird because like, wait, 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 a burger, you know, it doesn't involve batteries and smart grid and, you know, all this kind of stuff. None of that, it, that's going to be a pittance compared to what we can do with this. But anyway, the point is a myth that we get thrown at us all the time is regenerative agriculture. All we have to do is put more cows on earth and their little feet are going to, you know, increase soil carbon more than they're emitting. It's just completely insane. Yeah. So Pat, we've got a couple of minutes left. Maybe I'll grab one more one more topic. Uh, certainly, it's on the the minds of um, many of the the founders and the companies. Um, you've spoken on it a little bit, but just on you know how to capitalize companies, how to find investors who are aligned. Um, curious how you thought about sort of this capital raising and investing early on. And then if anything ab about the way you, you know, view or look at, you know, investors, you know, today, I'd say through, through a lens of impossible being, you know, many years later, if any of that has shifted for you, but curious well, if you could share some insights on kind of capital raising, you know, for these types of ambitious, bold, mission-driven companies that you know, do have a very deep science and technology base behind them. Yeah, so I mean, of course, I've done this exactly once, so I haven't done the control here. Um, the the thing that when I first uh, went out to raise money, fortunately, like Silicon Valley venture capitalists are used to wackos uh, coming to them, and and you know, with with like from a business standpoint, kind of lame business plans, but um, I I did my pitch, and it was sort of like pitching to the wrong audience. Fortunately, they were they were very receptive anyway, but I was it was all about the environmental impact and how we're going to save the planet and blah 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 blah. And um, oh by the way, it's a 1.5 trillion dollar market that that you know we will be going after, which was like I realized later, oh, that should have been the first slide. But um, but anyway, yeah, I think the thing is that what what mattered to them was that this is obviously something that's never been done before, absolutely far from guaranteed success, but that there was a plausible path that didn't require any physical laws to be suspended um, to get there. And, um, and, you know, we had some ideas that could have been wrong about how to do it um, and that the payoff is huge. And, you know, the thing is that these guys, they, the, the people we talked to, they understood our mission. And of course they, they, as any human being that wants to continue to live on earth does, you know, they, they cared about the mission, but they also are investing money on behalf of whatever teachers unions and, and people who depend on them to, to, you know, uh, be profitable. That's totally appropriate. So there needs to be a, a, a business case. Um, I think one advantage we had is that you know, if what we that what we were doing was kind of wacky, but potentially plausible, and the payoff is huge. You know, at that time, a trillion and a half dollars. It's going to be three trillion by the time by 2035, and so you know they'll do fine as investors. Um, we we subsequently we've always been filtering for mission alignment when we um, raise money. I don't want to raise money from someone who's going to be pushing us to sacrifice our long-term mission. Um, for short-term economics and so forth. Um, so that's something that we've used as a filter for, for choosing investors. Fortunately, we've, you know, haven't had tremendous difficulty finding investors who, who you know, see the potential value um, and that enables us to, to, you know, be somewhat selective. Um, and also we have, you know, we, we're looking for investors in general who, who can add value beyond the money that they invest. The main thing that we want is the money, but, you know, um, if they have other 
strategic advantages that's that's valuable and that's that's been true for some of our investors and so forth i'm not sure what kind of i wish i was a, a more business savvy guy and i could actually give useful advice on this i mean i guess the main thing is first of all you have to have a, an idea that that is thoughtful from an executable execution standpoint um and potentially a big impact that that puts you in a pretty good position i think Pat, I just wanted to thank you for spending time with us. The hour has has really flown by and just appreciate you sharing more of your story and also the mission of Impossible and creating um, additional inspiration and insights for other founders of, of companies with, with their own important missions. So thank you. Yeah, thanks for giving me the opportunity and I really enjoyed talking to you. So now we're gonna have a short break. Please everyone grab a refreshment and then join us back here for a conversation with uh, Matt Rogers and Elon Gurr, and then closing remarks by Reed Sturdivant.